Hey everybody, Josh Peck here. I wanted to do something a little special. I have an upcoming conference presentation and uh, I wanted to, I got the rough draft of it done and I want to refine it some. So what I'd love to do is present the presentation as I have it now. But what I would love for you to do is if you could leave me a comment in the comment section below and tell me what you think, uh, if anything should be added or removed or anything like that. Um, and uh, that would be a big help. I, I do this frequently whenever I have um, uh, a presentation coming up because it, it just it really helps. Uh, also, if you haven't had a chance, make sure you subscribe to this channel and click the bell for all notifications. It really does help. Um, at the time of this recording, we're almost at 40,000 subscribers. By the time this airs, we're probably already there now. Uh, so please subscribe, share this with your friends, spread this around. We're, we have a very exciting topic to talk about today, specifically where we're at in uh, the Enoch's Apocalypse of Weeks prophecy. It is mind-blowing. I mean, if this prophecy is correct, and it has been correct so far uh, in, in every way, then we are right at the precipice. We are right there. Now is the time. Um, so uh, I'm going to show you that. Uh, I'm going to show you the rough draft of my presentation, which is just me basically reading through it. So check this out. For those of you not familiar with me, my name is Josh Peck, and I work at Prophecy Watchers. Uh, I recently released a two-volume set of books called Forgotten Prophecies of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, the title pretty much says it all. Uh, in the books, I go through the history and the uh, really amazing prophecies that can be found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, many of which have to do with our day today. And I'd like to tell you about one of those prophecies. Uh, so for those not familiar, the Dead Sea Scrolls are a collection of extra-biblical uh, scrolls that were written and believed by a Jewish sect called the Essenes. The scrolls are believed to be written somewhere between two to three hundred years before the birth of Christ. The Essenes were known as maintaining the original Jewish interpretation of the Torah and Old Testament during a time when the Pharisees were believing in the Oral Torah, uh, the same traditions that Jesus spoke against. When we read through the Dead Sea Scrolls, we see the Essenes had a view of Scripture that is very similar to the way that we would interpret it today. We have something really amazing from the Book of Enoch, which was found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's a type of prophetic calendar that has been completely accurate so far. It's called the Apocalypse of Weeks. Now, according to the Essenes, the entirety of uh, human history, from the time of creation until the time of the new heavens and new earth, uh, will be 7,000 years. Enoch's Apocalypse of Weeks splits this time period up into 10 sets of weeks, with each week being 700 years and each day being 100 years. For each week, Enoch gives us a short prophecy. And so far, each prophecy has turned out to be absolutely correct. Now, right now, we have two main versions of the Book of Enoch. We have the Ethiopic version, which is much more complete. Uh, we also have the Dead Sea Scroll version, which is much more degraded and fragmented due to time. Uh, prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1940s, there was a big debate about the authenticity of the Ethiopic Book of Enoch. Uh, no one really knew for sure if it could be trusted. Well, now that we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, we can see how well it matches up, and at least in the case of Enoch's Apocalypse of Weeks, it matches up very well. So let's start to look at some of the content in these weeks, and I'll compare the Ethiopic versions with the Dead Sea Scroll versions as much as we can. A uh, study of this 10-week prophecy can be very extensive and really could fill the pages of a book all its own, but we can look at some of the basics to show how accurate it is. The Dead Sea Scrolls provides us with week one, the first half of week two, the second half of week seven, and weeks eight through ten in full. Uh, we can fill in the rest of the weeks with the Ethiopic version. Now explaining the first week, which would have been uh, 3925 to 3225 BC, uh, and part of the second week, which would have been 3225 to 2525 BC, from the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, the Book of Enoch states, When he was delivering his letter, Enoch resumed his speech and said, I, Enoch, was born on the seventh day in the first week, 
and until my time, justice was still strong. After me will come the second week when deceit and violence will increase. And that is 4Q Enoch 318, 24 through 25. Now, some translations, such as the Ethiopic Gias to English, render this passage as if Enoch were saying he was born in the seventh in a genealogical line during the first week. The Dead Sea Scrolls version says that he was born on the seventh day in the first week. Now, this is interesting because, in actuality, both would be correct. Uh, if we do all the math, we discover that Enoch was born in the year uh, 622 a.m., which would be uh, on, the, on the seventh day in the first week, if each day is 100 years. Also, that term a.m. just means Anno Monday. It means uh, uh, the year since the creation, basically. It's, it's year of the world. Um, so that would be the 622nd year of, of creation. So also, in accordance with the Ethiopic version, Enoch was the seventh generation from Adam. So either one of those interpretations would actually be correct. Uh, we're given the first few words of the second week from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And to understand what is said about the entire second week, we can look to the Ethiopic version, which is where we'll obtain all Ethiopic translations of this prophecy. So it says, uh, And after me there shall arise in the second week great wickedness, and deceit shall have sprung up, and in it there shall be the first end. And in it a man shall be saved, and after it is ended unrighteousness shall grow up, and a law shall be made for the sinners. It's Enoch 93, 4. So this is clearly lead, uh, talking about the events that led up to Noah's flood. Great wickedness was caused by fallen angels mating with human women. We get that from Genesis 6, 1 through 4. And there was the first, uh, the first end. Now, we're not sure what this is because the flood would have happened in 1656 a.m., so after this week, yet this week concludes in 1400 a.m. So technically the flood would have been in the third week. Now, it's possible that the first end here uh, described uh, doesn't have to do with the world being destroyed by the flood, but instead is referring to the genetic and moral corruption of humanity in the days of Jared, Enoch 6.6, 6, uh, we, we get that, uh, which would fall within this timeline. Also, the, the it from after it is ended, that might be talking about the wickedness, or it could be talking about the second week itself. Uh, but in either case, this part of the prophecy could be looking ahead a bit past the second week. Uh, Noah would be the man who was saved. Rather, uh, though, rather than describing the flood, this would be referring to him being saved from uh, from the genetic corruption of the fallen angels and Nephilim giants on earth in those days. Uh, unrighteousness rises again, so there is a law for sinners, which might be what uh, Noah was preaching about during this time, and we, we learn a little of that from Second Peter 2, 5, and that would have been before the flood was announced. So uh, now we're at week three, which this would have been 20, 20, 2525 to 1825 BC, um, the book of Enoch states, and after that, in the third week, at its close, a man shall be elected as the plant of righteous judgment and his posterity shall become the plant of righteousness forevermore. Uh, now keep in mind that it says at its close. So in this prophecy, we're only looking at uh, the close of the third week. And since that this only discusses the close of the third week, it could be that the description of the second week might have bled over a little bit into the beginning of the third. And if this is happening, we could consider the second and third weeks kind of together. Uh, in which case... Uh, we could include the flood in that scenario. Um, near the close of the third week, the only man this could be referring to is Abraham, the father of the Jewish people. This also tells us the term plant of righteousness has to do with the Jewish people. And that's going to be important because that'll come up again. Uh, so now we're on to week four, which uh, in our timeline would have been 1825 to 1125 BC. Enoch states, and after that, in the fourth week, at its close, visions of the holy and righteous shall be seen, and a law for all generations, and an enclosure shall be made for them. That's Enoch 93, 6. Uh, just to remind you again, we're reading from the Ethiopic right now because we don't have Dead Sea Scroll 
uh, version uh, version of the, the the middle part of these weeks. Um, so the events that best fit this description within this time are the Exodus and the giving of the law uh, to Moses and the children of Israel. Uh, Moses saw visions of the holy and righteous upon Mount Sinai. The law for all generations is the Torah, and the enclosure is most likely referring to the tabernacle or the first um, uh, entrance of the promised land by the children of Israel, since that falls within this this time period as well. Uh, next, we have week five, which is 1125 to 425 BC. Um, and after that, in the fifth week, at its close, the house of glory and dominion shall be built forever. That's Enoch 93.7. So this could be describing Solomon's temple, which would have been around uh, 2935 AM, if we're going by the Anno Mundi um, uh, way of looking at it. However, since it says at its close, it's most likely referring to the second temple, which uh, would have been in uh, 3408 AM. This could also have something to do with Israel itself rather than the temple. Also, I should note that, uh, don't let that word forever throw you. In in Hebrew, sometimes the word forever doesn't always mean a never-ending span of time. Uh, rather, it can mean a dispensation of time. And um, I, I do develop that idea further in another chapter of my book uh, when I read through a Dead Sea Scroll called Psalms of Exorcism. But since it applies to this prophecy, it may as well at least be mentioned here. Um, so we don't necessarily need to look for some kind of house that still exists, so it could still be that. But we can also include something that was built for a dispensation of time, then the temple would fit that description. Now, what's interesting is there is another Dead Sea Scroll called the Apocalyptic Chronology, or Apocryphal Weeks, that seems to be a commentary on this part of Enoch's prophecy. It states, uh, and this is fragmented, but it, it states, uh, determined end, and afterwards will come the fifth week, 480 years after the exodus from Egypt, Solomon built the temple, it was destroyed in the same, it was destroyed in the time of Zedekiah, king of Judah, it was restored by the Levites and the people of the land, final stage, king of Kittim. Kittim there means Rome. And, and again, that's from the apocalyptic chronology. <coughs> now, while there's not much there, we can pull out a couple of details. Uh, so in his book, Ancient Prophecies from the Dead Sea Scrolls, author Ken Johnson, my very good friend, provides uh, his commentary. He writes, this is thought to be a commentary on Enoch's 10 weeks prophecy from Enoch 93. The fifth week was 1125 to 425 BC. The Essenes understood that the Romans, Kittim, would destroy the Jerusalem temple. We also see in Daniel 11, 3, uh, 1133 that the Romans would burn down the Jerusalem temple. All right, let's go to week six. This would have been 425 BC to 275 AD. Uh, Enoch states, and after that in the sixth week, all who live in it shall be blinded, and the hearts of all them shall godlessly forsake wisdom, and in it a man shall ascend, and at its close the house of dominion shall be burnt with fire, and the whole race of the chosen root shall be dispersed. That's Enoch 93.8. So this is where it begins to get interesting. Remember, the Dead Sea Scrolls were written at least one or two hundred years before Christ, some, some probably longer. And it might be easy to invent something before the sixth week. However, uh, the Qumran community would have had the Book of Enoch prior to the birth of Christ, the destruction of the temple, and the scattering of the Jewish people among the nations. Yet, as we can plainly see in this one, this is what's being described in week six. This is also where we make the switch from B.C. to A.D. in our current system of recording years. Um, now, I am going through these very quickly, but again, it's because I'm limited on time. And the seventh week of Enoch, which would have been 275 to 975 AD, that's probably the most difficult one to interpret. And because time is limited, I'm going to skip it here. Uh, but if you want a full breakdown of the seventh week and what I believe to, it to be referring to, you can check out, again, my new two-volume set, Forgotten Prophecies of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Best place to get it is prophecywatchers.com, and I explain it all there. So let's move right on to the uh, eighth week, which would have been 975 to 16, uh, 1675 AD. The Ethiopic version states, And after that there shall be another, the eighth week, that of righteousness, and a sword shall be given to it, that a righteous judgment may be executed on the oppressors. 
and sinners shall be delivered into the hands of the righteous. And at its close they shall acquire houses through their righteousness, and a house shall be built for the great king in glory forevermore. Enoch 91, 12 through 13. Uh, now we have we have the Dead Sea Scroll version of this as well, which says, And after uh, after this, the eighth week will come, the one of justice, in which a sword will be given to all the just for them to carry out just judgment against the wicked who will be delivered into their hands. At its close, they will gain riches and justice, and there will be built the temple of the kingship of the Great One in his magnificence for all eternal generations. It's 4Q Enoch 4, 15 through 18. So as we can see, these tr these uh, translations are very similar. We have uh, the Crusades during this time, in which, at, at least in part, European Christians were fighting against uh, the oppression of Muslims. Uh, the success of the First Crusade occurred in uh, AD 1099, uh, right at the beginning of Enoch's eight, eighth week. Now, just to be clear, the accuracy of this prophecy wouldn't necessarily justify every action of every human being during the Crusades. And because this is such a contested and debated topic, uh, attempting to find out exactly what happened during that time can be really challenging because everybody, e each modern and historical source seems to have its own bias. Especially today, sources try to paint the Crusades in either the best or the worst light possible. And it's entirely possible that God had his plans accomplished through this time, but fallible human beings took it much too far and began operating outside of the will of God. Uh, however, the prophecy of week eight mentions the righteous. So can God consider sinful men as righteous? Uh, well, of course, this is one of the main tenets of Christianity. We are considered righteous not by our own acts, but by the blood of Jesus, which watch, washes away all sin. Now, that's not an excuse to sin, but it's a remedy for the fallen state of man. And in fact, as we discover when reading through the Bible, God has a habit of working through imperfect human beings. Uh, Lot, according to Genesis, was extremely carnal. He offered his daughters to a ravenous mob, uh, Genesis 19, 1 through 11, and even entered an incestuous sexual relationship with his daughters after getting drunk, and that's Genesis 19, 30 through 38. Yet, Lot was still considered righteous by biblical standards. Second Peter 2, 7 through 8 says, And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man in anguish over the debauched lifestyle of lawless men, for while he lived among them day after day, that righteous man was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. So how can this be? Well, it's because our righteousness is not measured by our actions, but by our faith. In the Old Testament, we see that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. It's Genesis 15, 6. So today, the only difference between the believer and the unbeliever is the blood of Christ that washes away our sins. And because of that, we're considered righteous despite those sins. So I just wanted to make that clear because the Crusades is a contentious topic. Uh, now, the second part of week, the week eight prophecy seems to be about the Protestant Reformation. And this is interesting because in week seven, the Jewish people had their own type of uh, rebellion against man-made traditions in favor of biblical text by itself. Uh, and uh, again, I had to skip week seven, uh, but you can find it in the book. So um, near the end of week eight, uh, Martin Luther rebelled against the Catholic Church and perpetuated a movement of Christianity that also rejected uh, man-made traditions in favor of biblical text by itself. So the, the temple or houses in the prophecy likely refers to the body of Christ since believers are described as temples in, in, the, in the Bible. Could also be the church buildings themselves, but uh, 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Uh, and then we have 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 3, which says, For we know that if our earthly house, the tent we live in, is dismantled, we have a building from God, a house not built by human hands that is eternal in, in the heavens. For in this earthly house we groan because we desire to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed after we have put on our heavenly house, we will not be found naked. So when we put Christ first and truly follow him, we together become his temple. Each Christian becomes a house to the Lord and winning souls to the Lord through faith instead of works can easily fulfill the part of the prophecy that says we Christians will acquire houses through their righteousness. 
And uh, the temple that is built for the Lord is the whole body of believers in Christ who trust in him for salvation rather than their own works. And again, that word house uh, could just be referring also to the actual church buildings uh, that get built and, and the congregations that inhabit them. So here's the really interesting one. This is Enoch's uh, Apocalypse of Week 9. So Week 9, this would be from, 17, or from 1675 A.D., to 2375 AD, this begins to explore a future time from our own, in part. So the Ethiopic version says, and after that, in the ninth week, the righteous judgment shall be revealed to the whole world, and all the works of the godless shall vanish from the earth, and the world shall be written down for destruction, and all mankind shall look to the path of uprightness. That's Enoch 91.14. The Dead Sea Scroll version uh, says, and after that, the ninth week, in it will be revealed justice and just judgment to all the sons of the whole earth. All those who act wickedly will vanish from all the whole earth, and they shall be hurled into the eternal well. All men will see the just eternal path. That's 4Q Enoch 419 through 22a. So it's probably obvious that this is referring to the return of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And this week occurs, again, between the years of 1675 and 2375. Well, what's really interesting is the exact midpoint of week nine, half of seven, uh, half of 700, 700 years is 350, so 350 years after 1675 is 2025. That's the exact midpoint of week nine. That is just uh, a year away, and at, at the time of this uh, recording, but this is um, this is, as I show in, uh, as I show in my book, the beginning of, uh, the beginning of the final jubilee of our age of grace before the kingdom age is supposed to begin according to the Essenes. So is that just a coincidence? Now, when I first came across this, I wanted to see if there was any indication that there's something unique about this week. Um, I wanted to know if there was any reason beyond just the interest in the year 2025 to read the prophecy this way. Uh, I wondered if we should expect the events of this prophecy to occur at the midway point. But then I noticed a, a detail about how the time frames within the weeks are described. There's a commonality among almost all the weeks that uh, that week nine doesn't share. So most describe something happening at the close of a week. But week nine doesn't suggest whether these events will happen at the beginning, middle, or near the close of the week. So that made me wonder if any other week has a similar lack of description about the timing. Well, the first week does give us an idea of the timing. As Enoch says, he was born on the seventh day in the first week. So this would have correlated to between 600 and 700 a.m. And in fact, he was born in 622, so that's accurate. Um, the second week, much like the ninth, does not offer us any kind of timeline. The only thing we know is a man, presumably Noah, will be saved through what we can assume is the sin of the watchers and eventual uh, genetic and moral corruption of the entire world. And uh, chapter 6 of the book of Enoch tells us that this event began in the days of Jared. So Enoch 6.6 6 says, And they were in all 200 who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon, and they called it Mount Hermon because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. So the days of Jared would have been between the years 460 a.m. and 1422 a.m., since that is when Jared was born and died. We know the second week would have been between 700 and 1400 a.m., so this actually fits as well. Also, for a man to be saved in it, it stands the reason he would have needed to already have been born. Well, Noah was born in 1056 a.m. Now, note that the halfway point between 700 and 1400 is actually 1050 a.m. So the year 1050 a.m. is exactly the halfway point of week two. Therefore, when we're not offered a description of the specific time, such as the close or the seventh day, we have something that seems to point to roughly the middle of the week in which was uh, born Noah, the man who was saved. Um, so weeks three through eight all have something pointing to the end of the week with the phrase at its close. Week nine 
like week two, doesn't contain a hint of timing within the description of the week. And then lastly, week 10 describes the seventh part. The only two weeks that do not offer us a time frame are week two and week nine. Week two seems to contain a reference that could be pointing to the halfway point. So could it be that if a timing is not offered, that it's meant to be understood as describing events that will occur in the middle of the week, roughly in the middle? And if so, then could we begin to see the fulfillment of Enoch's ninth week, uh, which is clearly all about the tribulation? I mean, the people that you know, the the people who sinned are being are being thrown into the the great well. I mean, that's people who take the mark of the beast that are thrown into the lake of fire. It, you know, so could it be that we're 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 going to be seeing that roughly in the middle of our week, which is coming? I mean, that's we're there now. Um, uh, the middle of our weeks in in twenty twenty five. And week two is only six years off from that. So you figure you got a seven-year tribulation, and roughly uh, it could be happening pretty soon. Or is this just a coincidence, and it's possible uh, that uh, we misread the whole thing? I mean, you know, of course we have to, we have to think about that as well. But I, I, think that it's, I think that it's possible that this is all accurate. And roughly around the year 2025, you can't, here's what I've noticed about the prophecies in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, unless they give you a specific date, it's really hard to pinpoint one. Uh, so around the year 2025, should we, should we start seeing some things happen? Does, does this time period that we're living in now hold prophetic significance? Uh, so obviously the ninth week is very exciting, but let's move on to the tenth. And this concludes the apocalypse, uh, the apocalypse of weeks with week 10. And this would be, uh, 2375 to 3075 AD. The Ethiopic version of Enoch states that after this, in the tenth week in the seventh part, there shall be the great eternal judgment in which he will execute vengeance among the angels. And the first heaven shall depart and pass away, and a new heaven shall appear, and all the powers of heaven shall give sevenfold light. Enoch 91, 15 through 16. And the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, version renders the passage this way. And after that, the tenth week, in its in its seventh part, there will be eternal judgment and the moment of the great judgment, and he will carry out revenge in the midst of the holy ones. In it, the first heaven will pass away, and there will appear a new heaven, and all the forces of heaven will rise throughout all eternity, shining uh, seven times more. 4Q Enoch 22b through 25a. Well, this clearly refers to the end of the kingdom age, the the, uh, the, white, the great white throne judgment and the creation of the new heavens and new earth. This also sounds like Isaiah thirty twenty six, which says, Moreover, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold as the light of seven days in the day that the Lord binds up the bruise of his people and heals the stroke of their wound. So absolutely fascinating stuff. Now let's talk about after the apocalypse of week. So going back to the seventh part of week 10, the prophecy says the great judgment against the angels occurs in the seventh part, which would be the same, uh, which would be, which would be sometime during the final 100 years of the 10th week. So this means the period would begin in AD 20, uh, 2975. So sometime after that, we don't know exactly when, since it just says in its seventh part, possibly during the last Jubilee of the kingdom age, uh, the final 50 years or so, the final judgment will begin to occur. And then next, after all that is done, new creation begins. If there is a correlation between uh, the times and events of ages, 1,000 years before this judgment is set to start would have been the year uh, 1975 AD. Um, so this means in our age, we've finished almost half of our final uh 100 years and are heading towards our final jubilee pointing again to the year 2025. So if this prophecy is accurate, our time within the current order of things is truly short. Um, Jesus is set to return sometime in the ninth week to set up his kingdom and near the end of the tenth week will be the final judgment explained in Revelation. We get this from Revelation 27 through 15 which says, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp 
of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Again, that's Revelation 27 through 15, KJV. Now, while this is a horrific reality, the wonderful news is that none of us needs to actually go through this terrible judgment. We can put our trust in Christ today, escape eternal torment, and live within a, uh, an eternal bliss. Now, finally, to explain what comes after the 10 weeks. The Dead Sea Scroll version of Enoch states, After that, there will be many weeks, the number of which will not have an end ever, in which goodness and justice will be achieved. That's 4Q Enoch 4, 25b through 26. The Ethiopic version says something similar, but we're offered a couple more verses that are worth reading. Uh, it, and this is Enoch 91, 17 through 19. It says, And after that there will be many weeks without number forever, and all shall be in goodness and righteousness, and sin shall be no more mentioned uh, shall no more be mentioned forever. And now I tell you, my sons, and show you the paths of righteousness and the paths of violence. Yea, I will show them to you again, that ye may know what will come to pass. And now hearken unto me, my sons, and walk in the paths of righteousness, and walk not in the paths of violence. For all who walk in the paths of unrighteousness shall perish forever. Well, it's a tragic truth that there are many who will, that there are many who will not heed these words, uh, who will choose the paths of unrighteousness by denying Christ and who will perish forever without hope. So for anyone, um, for anyone listening, this does not have to be your fate. As long as there is breath in your lungs, there's still time to ensure your eternal security by putting your uh, trust in Jesus. And this is not achieved by works or proving your own righteousness. Scripture tells us that God sees our righteousness as filthy rags. And that's Isaiah 64, 6. Instead, it's, it's, by accomplish, it's accomplished by accepting the gift of salvation in Jesus through faith and allowing his righteousness to be credited to you. And in making that decision, you can be assured that you will get to enjoy all the eternal gifts described in the final chapter of uh, Revelation and elsewhere throughout the Bible. Um, and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, so I, I delve more into these amazing promises and descriptions of eternity uh, in uh, my new two-volume set again. But in closing, if in closing, if you haven't already, uh, I would highly encourage you all to consider taking this chance today, right now, to accept God's gift of salvation through His Son Jesus Christ. All right, so that is the rough draft of my presentation so far. I would love it, again, if you could tell me what you think in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel and click the bell to turn on all notifications. If you haven't had a chance yet, head on over to dailyrenegade.com and get a membership today. It's only $10 a month or $100 a year. And I would suggest getting the $100 a year because it's a lot cheaper in the long run. Essentially, you get two months for free doing it that way, getting the 100 a year. Again, don't forget to subscribe. And thank you so much. So much. Until next time, take care and God bless.